Hello! Today we're going to finish our unit on the animal kingdom and we're going to focus in on chordates. Now, if you're a chordate, you have to have four characteristics at some point in your life. So the first characteristic is a notochord. Right? So all chordates have a strong, flexible, rod-like structure called the notochord at some part in their lives. Okay, this will form in the embryo just beneath the neural tube, and it's located between the gut and the nerve cord. Um, it is made of cartilage, and it is composed of fluid-filled cells that are encased in a stiff, fibrous tissue. The notochord will run the length of the organism near the dorsal surface. Okay, the next one is the dorsal nerve cord. All right, so all chordates have a hollow tubular dorsal nerve cord. If you remember, in vertebrates, their nerve cord was on the ventral surface. The nerve cord is a group of nerves that are located above the notochord. Okay, and it begins to form in the embryo from a plate of the ectoderm tissue that will roll into a tube located dorsally. Now, the brain and the spinal cord of us um, have developed from this dorsal nerve cord. Um, the third characteristic is gill slits. So all chordates have pharyngeal gill slits or gill pouches at some time in their development. Okay, as far as that goes, the gill slits are paired openings in the wall of the pharynx or the throat. Um, they do filter as filter feeding in the um, earlier chordates, and they are modified for gas exchange and other functions during the vertebrate evolution. Okay, um, the Gill slits can close up and become the lungs as it is with us. The last characteristic is a post-anal tail. This is pretty much a tail that extends beyond the anus. All right, the, the non-chordates, typically their digestive tract ended at the end of their body, okay? So for us, the post-anal tail contains skeletal elements, muscle, um, and it does help with the propulsive force that aquatic species have. All right, some animals, um, it does disappear during the embryonic development, okay? So most chordates lose or modify one or more of these structures as they mature into adults. This is just showing you the general plan. We have the gill slits here. There's my arrow, the gill slits, the dorsal nerve cord, the notochord, and again, the post-anal tail. All right. Some characteristics about the chordates. They all have bilateral symmetry. They have the true body cavity or true coelom. They are deuterostomes. Okay. And they are divided into three subphylums. We have the urochordates, the cephalochordates, and the vertebrates. Okay. So we're going to focus in on the first subphylum, which is the simplest, which is the urochordates. Um, the example of the urochordates are the sea squirts or the tunicates. Uh, they are all marine and they are typically sessile. They attach to the bottom, rocks, docks, boats, wherever, um, as adults. Okay, they're very, very common on coral reefs and um, they are colonial, so they do kind of exist together. So, as an adult, they only are going to retain their gill slits throughout the life. Okay, so the chordate characteristics only in the larva stage are the dorsal nerve cord, the notochord, and the postanal tail. So the gill slits they have as a larva, and then they will retain that throughout their entire lives. And that is going to be used for respiration and feeding. So they are a filter feeder. Okay, so they strain the water through their gill slits. Okay, they do have an incurrent siphon where water is going to enter. It will then pass through the gill slits into the cavity, and then the water with the waste will exit out through the excurrent siphon. Food is filtered by a mucus net and cilia in the intestine and then into the anus. And again, the an anus enters into the excurrent siphon. And this is just showing you um, what the sea squirt or a tunicate looks like. Um, it's really a sac within a sac. They have an inner and an outer sac. The inner sac has that pharynx, and the outer sac is called the tunic, which is primarily extracellular material of cellulose. Very, very simple structure. There's no backbone, no notochord, no nerve cord, or tail as in adults. Again, they only have their um, gill slits, and they don't have a definite head at all. 
Okay. So just so you know, when you touch a C squirt, um, water will stream out of that X current siphon. Okay, and this is just the basic structure. Um, the tunic is a tough covering that surrounds the body. Okay. Okay, we'll watch that video in class. So the next subphylum is the cephalochordates. This is the lancelets. Um, these are very tiny, um, only a few centimeters long. They do retain all four chordate characteristics throughout their life. Okay, they do have a definite head, and that's what cephalo means. Okay, they are marine, and they filter feed. Um, they pump water over their gills. Food is trapped by the mucus that was secreted, um, and that's how they get it. Now, they do swim in spirals because uh, their muscles are arranged like these chevrons. Um, so pretty much it wriggles backwards into the sand and it only has its head exposed and it will spin and it spins like a spiral because of it has very poorly developed fins and the way their muscles are attached. Okay, but it is a very stream like body. So you could see that um, there's a head that will stick out. Um, they do live in shallow coasts. Uh, they don't have the backbone. Okay, but they do have all those um, characteristics that we have, the, the notochord, the dorsal nerve cord, the um, gill slits, and the post-anal tail. Okay. And this is what has evolved from our fish. That's what we're going to talk about next, which will start off with the subphylum of the vertebrates. Okay, so vertebrate means backbone, okay? Um, vertebrates have their name because of the large number of bones that surround and protect their nerve cords. So the bones are called vertebrae. The nerve cord, okay, turns into the spinal cord. Okay, and the gill slits are our throat and our ear. And this is the largest subphylum. We are broken down into different classes, and we're going to talk about the different seven different classes. Agnatha, chondrocytes, and osteocytes are the fish, amphibians, reptiles, aves are birds, and then the mammals. So let's talk about the jawless fish. Okay, this is the lamprey and um, the hagfish. Um, lamprey is the oldest lineage of vertebrates, and that's the connection with the cephalochordates. Um, they are slippery, scaleless, or eel-like. Um, they are um, freshwater okay, in streams, um, they retain all their norticord, the gill slits, as an adult. Okay. Very minimal skeleton, okay? Um, it does not have scales. Um, it has like a slimy skin. It has unpaired fins, very eel-like, and it has a round mouth okay with a rasping tongue it will suck mud and it will filter feed it takes in sediments and suspended organic debris through their mouth and then it passes it through the gill slits where the food is trapped and the gill slits are also going to be for gas exchange also okay they are ectotherms which is means they're cold-blooded means they adapt to their surrounding temperature again they filter feed now we're going to start talking about their circulatory system. We're going to learn that they have a two-chambered heart. So every time we develop a chamber in a heart, we're going to learn about the flow of blood. So that will be coming in a second. All right. So a two-chambered heart has an atrium and a ventricle. Okay. Now, the blood will flow from the atrium to the ventricle to the ventral aorta. It will go to the arteries and then to the gills to pick up the oxygen. It will go through capillaries, then it will go back to the dorsal aorta through the body, and then it will collect in a chamber called the sinus venosus. Okay, very simplistic as far as the heart goes. The two-chambered heart is the simplest of all of the chambers of the hearts. Um, it will develop into a three-chambered heart, and then the last is the four-chambered heart, which is the most efficient. So just to review, Agnatha is made up of the jawless fish, which is the lamprey and the hagfish. Um, this is what the lamprey would look like. They're found in the Great Lakes. Uh, they are a parasite that will suck blood and fluids from fish. 
Um, they have a great sense of smell that helps them locate the prey. And you can see here that their mouth is sucker shaped, okay? And it's lined with teeth. So the mouth is gonna actually put a hole in the fish and with their rasping tongue. And it will secrete a chemical that will keep the fish from blood, the fish's blood from clotting. So it will suck in the blood fluids in the tissue. Doesn't have a stomach. Um, and it will um, live as larva for years in freshwater streams, and then it migrates to the Great Lakes or the sea um, as they mature into the adults. Okay, and that's just their their teeth, mouth with their rasping tongue. Hagfish are bottom dwellers in cold marine waters. Um, they're scavengers of dead and dying fish, um, especially those that are caught in nets. Um, they um, feed on sick dead fish and eat marine worms. Now, their mouth parts are not as adapted for rasping, but they do have a very toothed tongue, which will take, it's like almost like a saw, and it saws a hole in the fish and eats them from the inside out. Um, it will enter through the mouth or the anus of the prey and eats the tissue from the inside, rapidly reducing the body to a bag of skin and bowls. Um, it really doesn't have the larval stage and it lives entirely in salt water. Now it's noted for its prolific mucus production. Um, a single hagfish is able to fill a large bucket with slime in a matter of seconds. And we'll see that in the YouTube video um, in class. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the cartilage fish or the chondrochytes. These are our sharks, skates, and rays. <laughs> Um, they do have a movable jaw that is attached to their skull, um, and that really allows them to become predators that help pursue their prey. Uh, their skeleton is made entirely of cartilage, which makes it very um, flexible. Their skin contains a number of sharp um, denticles, which um, is what we call placoid scales. A placoid scale is very smooth if you rub in one direction, and then as you go in the opposite direction, it's like sandpaper, it's very rough. They do have paired fins. This is just showing the placoid scale. If you go in this direction, it's smooth, and if you go in this direction, it's very, very rough. And they're showing you the paired fins. Now, their gills are not covered, like we will see in the typical fish. Um, they are made up of gill filaments and gill rakers, just like we'll see when we dissect the fish. Uh, the gill filaments will absorb oxygen from the water, and the gill rakers kind of screen the food particles out from entering into the gill slicks, okay? And it kind of redirects the food into the esophagus. Water will flow over them as they move. So if they're resting, they still have to pump water over their gills, and they kind of have to swim constantly to get water over their gills. They have that two-chambered heart with the atrium and the ventricle, and they are also ectotherms. They have excellent vision and a very big um, sense of smell. Their head um, can detect electrical fields from their surroundings. They have what's called an electro, um, a lateral line. The lateral line is a row of sensory organisms that run along each side of the fish. It is very sensitive to changes in water pressure. Um, it can detect minor vibrations caused by near um, by animals, and again, it runs the entire length of the flank, um, and it is microscopic. Okay. They have what's called the spiral valve. A spiral valve um, helps to increase the surface area within the intestine. And if you notice, when we do the dissections, the intestines is quite small um, compared to the necessary nutrients that need to be delivered. Um, so the spiral valve is a corkshoe-shaped ridge, which will increase the surface area and prolongs the passage of food along that short digestive tract. And their teeth, they have about 6 to 20 different rows of teeth. This is just showing you the spiral valve. So um, we will continue our notes on the chordates with the rest of the classes. So please watch the next video. Thanks.